Caliber Scholar like Dr. Heiser obviously availed himself to be here. So we're so grateful and thankful for that. So thank you, Dr. Heiser, for being here. Just a quick uh, introduction to Dr. Heiser. Uh, Dr. Heiser has a PhD in Hebrew and Biblical and Semitic Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, he is also a scholar of the Bible and its ancient context. And uh, I think, Dr. Heiser, you probably now already have a little higher, but it should be up there. It's probably 100 years of teaching experience uh, in university <laughs> classrooms and online education. Uh, but please, if you are willing to uh, search the internet a little bit, you'll see that he's also a regular contributor to Faith Life Bible Study Magazine. Uh, he's uh, part of the staff at Celebration Church in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and the, the, the work just goes on and on and on, and I really just don't want to absorb Dr. Heiser's time. Uh, but uh, if you've not read any of Dr. Heiser's books, it is incredibly interesting to read. It's gripping. It is always lucid. Uh, his thoughts that we will look at today is based on his book uh, that he has written, The Supernatural, uh, what the Bible teaches about the unseen world and why it matters. I would say please get as quickly as you possible can anything that he has written because it's worth your while. Uh, Dr. Heise is also the creator of the Naked Bible blog and the popular Naked Bible podcast. Um, I follow him on his YouTube channel and I can tell you one thing, there's always something interesting from aliens right up to any question that you can ever think of. And, and you might think it's not scholarly, watch it. You will be blown away. It is just incredible. Uh, and also, Dr. Heiser um, has a nonprofit ministry um, that provides uh, translations of his free uh, work free of charge into multiple languages. So, Dr. Heiser, we're going to start immediately uh, for the sake of time. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start with a question from the book itself. Uh, and Dr. I say in chapter one, you start with a question that I think is relevant to the central theme uh, of the book. Uh, you write on page 14, do you believe that the what the Bible says? Then you add, the Bible has some pretty strange things in it, things that are hard to believe, especially in a modern world. So here's the question. In the West, there seems to be an anti-supernaturalist bias where the very idea of the supernatural is discounted as analogous or even fiction. Can Christians afford themselves such bias? <laughs> well, you know, the, the short answer is, to me, this has become an issue of biblical authority. Um, I think, the, you know, I, I hate to say it, but what I bring up in the book and what you just described in, the, in your question I think is going to become an issue uh, in evangelical theology, just broadly speaking, and and that that's one of the that's one of the uncomfortable things that not only this book, Supernatural, but the the larger version, the academic version, Unseen Realm, sort of brings to the surface, and it's a, it's an uncomfortable question for a lot of evangelicals. You know, I in, in both books, I, you know, I. I refer to or I describe what I call selective supernaturalism. That is, you know, if I walked into a church and, and, and accused, you know, people of, you know, Christians there of being, you know, weak on, on their recognition of the supernatural, they're going to object right away. Well, we believe in God, we believe in the Trinity, we believe in the virgin birth and the deity of Christ, and, you know, the resurrection, so on and so forth. And it's, it's like, yeah, I, I know, and, and all that's good, all that's necessary. Um, but why is it that you can embrace those things, and yet in other passages you, you know, really go through a tremendous effort to make the text not say what it says, because it offends your, you know, it doesn't seem rational. You know, and I'm talking about things like Genesis 6. I'm talking about things like cosmic geography that emerge out of the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Um, you know, and, and just a, not any number of passages that somehow or another were, were offended that, you know, we, we don't want to embrace these things because it just they just feel too weird or, or they're just not palatable to our, our modern mind. And, and again, my question is a simple one. Why is it that, that we get to take the biblical statements on the supernatural world and put them in two piles? This one is somehow acceptable and feels rational to me, or at least I can feel like I can defend it rationally. And then this other pile, it 
I, I can't, I just can't go there. You know, I can't, you know, let, let the text speak for itself. I think it's very inconsistent, and I don't think the church uh, is wise. I mean, the, the, the church is going to sustain, you know, this and lots of other things because it's the church. God is going to be in it. He's going to rescue it from itself like he always has. Um, but I think we, we really make things, we, we, we make people vulnerable. I mean, all it takes is an enterprising atheist on the Internet, and there are plenty of these, who are all of a sudden going to say, well, you know, this, this stuff that you reject about, this, about the spiritual world, it comes from the same source as this other stuff, virgin birth, resurrection. You know, why, why isn't that irrational? Why are you so inconsistent? I, I mean, why should I listen to you, Mr. Christian, and you telling me about, you know, God and his activities and his power when you don't affirm a lot of this material? Why, why should I listen to you? Why should I believe that pi, you know, pile A is good and pile B is, you know, something to be explained away? So I, I think we're going to have a real problem with, with people who hold the church's feet to the fire on that issue, and it's going to become an issue of biblical authority. I mean, I, I, I've crossed that, that you know, river already uh, where I, I knew how inconsistent it was. And, you know, I, I'm sorry, but the, 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 the blunt truth is that nothing we believe, a creation, deity of Christ, virgin birth, the, the whole concept of salvation. How does a, how does a man, you know, who, who of course claims to be God, die on a cross, and how is that, you know, going to redeem my soul and the whole cosmos? I mean, none of these things that we believe conform to modern science. None of them are testable. Okay, it, it, nothing we believe, you know, is going to appeal to a materialistic mind okay, of, of the modern world. And we need to own that. It's very inconsistent to think that I can defend five or six things, you know, on, on a rational, you know, coherence basis, but I can't defend these other things. My view is you can defend them, and they need to be defended, and they need to be embraced, because otherwise your theology is quite inconsistent, and you make people vulnerable to this sort of attack. Absolutely. Well, one of the examples you mentioned, it comes from 1 Kings 22 and 19 to 23, where uh, angels congregate with God in a council to decide what happened on earth. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned that these strange passages are very important, um, and you've just given us a glimpse as to why this is so. Uh, is there maybe a form of evangelicalism, maybe in our world, uh, especially where the Old Testament have been neglected? Where people have lost interest because they read the Old Testament and it's all allegorized um, and it's seen almost without meaning. Uh, could you add something to that? Yeah, this is this is actually a kind of a an irritation to me. I, I get irritated over lots of things. <laughs> yes, but, um, we we have perpetuated the myth that the Old Testament is quote all about Jesus. Mm. You know, I, I'm I'm sorry, but but where we bury our our human waste is not about Jesus. Laws on on menstruation in the Torah are not about Jesus. I mean, I can go on and on and on and on and on. This stuff isn't about Jesus. It is about a worldview that, if we understood it, we would see how even those passages contribute something to the understanding of what God is up to, which ultimately does hinge on, on the work of Christ, the faithfulness of Jesus. You know, in those instances, we have a life force and we have sacred space versus profane space. Those are important concepts. Yeah. You know, but but, but we, we get lazy. We, well, it's all about Jesus. And so people think you know, that, that we're be, that are hearing us, us preach this or teach it. Well, I know about, I know about Jesus. I know the story. I know who that is. I, you know, I know the doctrines that that are important. So I guess I know the Old Testament. So what does it matter? You know, we 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 train people to not think. Mm. You know, mm. or we protect them from their Bible. Okay, I, I'm I'm just, you know, I, I reached a point, you know, 10, 15 years ago where I just told myself and the Lord, I am not going to do that anymore. 
I'm not going to protect people from their own Bible. They don't need to be protected from it. You know, it, I just, I was done with that. And, you know, I, I had to go through the process myself. I was a doctoral student. I'm in a good PhD program. I've taught for five years. I've taught over 20 classes. And then as I relate in Unseen Realm, I, you know, someone confronts me with Psalm 82, you know, in Hebrew. And I have no idea what's going on. You know, and, and it's like, how in the world could I have never run into this? You know, because it affects so many things. And so I have had to go through this process myself. I have had to, to, to resist the temptation of making scripture conform to my modern rationalistic approach to it. I have had to, to bow the knee, okay, to the, the idea that what the Bible says about the spiritual world, I need to embrace because I'm not, I, that's not my world. I'm from the world of embodiment, okay? Mm. I'm not a deity. I'm not, you know, an Elohim. I'm, I'm none of this stuff, okay? So, so what Scripture tells me about this, and I know I can trust it because of its faithfulness, you know, in, in all sorts of other ways, I need to submit to it. Okay, I, I need to adopt it as my theology. And then I need to try to read the scripture like an ancient person would, especially the Old Testament. This is why I say I want the Israelite living in your head when you read the Old Testament. And I want the first century Jew living in your head when you read the New Testament. Because the Bible was written to them by people mm -hmm. living at the same time. We need to understand what, the, what God was, was prompting them to try to communicate and then apply it to our lives and form our faith and doctrine you know, and our practice accordingly instead of filtering it through our modern traditions. What, what typically happens is, is our denominations, you know, they, they become about perpetuating themselves, perpetuating a subculture. And I'm just done with that. I, I, don't, I don't shoot at any denomination. I don't endorse any of it. They, they all have a purpose. You know, they, they were useful in my own life, you know, and, and, and still are in different ways, but they are not the text. Okay, the, 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 it really should be about what, what the text tells us, what the text can sustain in, in terms of our ability to understand it. And this is one of these things, these strange passages that we make go away by saying, oh, it's just about Jesus anyway. And we know about him so we can move on. Again, that, that breeds laziness when it comes to, to studying Scripture. And I, you know, I, I tell students, look, this thing that you have on your phone or your iPad or you're holding on your lap or it's sitting on your desk, you claim to believe it's the Word of God. You, you might want to invest some time in it if you really think that. You know, but but we, we allow people these little escape valves. Um, to avoid really getting into it. And I just one other thing. Again, I, I could just go on and on about this because it, I, I think this is just foundational. That's My great. experience has been that I think ministers and pastors and teachers routinely underestimate the interest, you know, the really the the aptitude and the appetite for Scripture in the people that they're they're preaching to and they're teaching. Sure. I think the lay person is routinely underestimated. They're bored yeah. because you have made them bored, okay? You have convinced them that there isn't too much else to know. Mm -hmm. And it's the same old stuff. It's it's self-help, Jesus is your cosmic life coach, you know, kind of stuff rather than really getting getting them past that and and into the meat of the word and and People, again, in my experience, if you, if you just get them to nibble a little bit on things, they get interested because they care about Scripture. They, they want to know. They really do. It's just that they, they don't really know how, and, and it, it feels too much like work. But, you know, yeah, I got, I got degrees, and I'm, I'm a you know, best-selling author, and I'm a professor. But what I really am is I'm the result of five minutes a day. For 30 years. That's what I am. Yeah, very good. Very you know, I knew nothing before I came to the Lord as a teenager. Yes. I knew who Adam and Eve were. I had heard of Noah and I'd heard of Jesus. And that was the end of the road. 
Wow. Well, Dr. Yeah. Hauser, just for the listeners out there, you actually wrote a book in 2014 called I Dare You Not to Bore Me with the Bible. And I yeah. thought that was, that was actually a very good theological question. Brother Caswell, question? Yes. Dr. Heiser, uh, I think in the light of the, the wonderful foundation you've laid, uh, in page 26 you write something quite intriguing where you say a lot of what Christians imagine to be true about the unseen world isn't. And in brackets <laughs> of that, <laughs> you mentioned uh, angels with wings, a devil with a tail and a pitchfork, etc. Uh, but then you also notice that there are these gods uh, that you call God's task force, that he seems to call upon when he makes decisions. And that is quoted in Psalm, two, uh, Psalm 82, verse 1. So I've got two questions actually for that. But the first one would be, this is obviously not polytheism, but you do give some context as to what we should know about these beings when God orders his business. That is in page, uh, page 30. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There there are there's sort of some core elements um, to the book Supernatural and I think to biblical theology in general. And they really go back to a very simple question, that is, what does God want? And which is why I wrote that little book for, for new believers or seekers, uh, the one that's translated on the website that Rudolph mentioned. You know, what God wants is a family. He already had a supernatural family before he created humans. We know that from Job 38. He wants a human family. So he creates, you know, creatures that can have a relationship with him. He shares his attributes with them. He, he calls them his imagers. They're going to be his representatives, his proxies on earth uh, to enjoy the things that he has made and to participate with him in enjoying and maintaining that creation and that, that's, this is just the story of genesis you know so so god wants children and he wants partners he doesn't need either he just wants them okay god needs nothing so the situation that we see develop in genesis is actually a mirror of what goes on in the heavens and we find that out in passages like you know, 1 Kings 22, we look at the terminology, sons of God, you know, supernatural beings, members of the heavenly host. Mm -hmm. You get the same family language. You get the same sense of participation. It's just that's in their realm, and then humans have this other realm. So God wants the same thing. And, and Eden was, was where God came to earth to be with his creatures. And where God is, where his house is, his throne is, and his entourage is. So it was literally like heaven meeting earth, heaven coming to earth. And so God wants sort of a blended family. Humans were fit for sacred space the moment they were created. This is what God wants. He wants people with him. Now we know from falls and rebellions and all this stuff that, that people have to be redeemed and things need to you know, be remade and all that. But fundamentally, this is what God wants. And so the reason why observing what goes on in the heavens, divine council meetings, is important and and what those beings are called how god refers to them okay. it's important because that is a template for how god thinks about us mm. i'll give you one example holy ones in the old testament overwhelmingly kedoshim refers to supernatural beings members of the heavenly host there might be one or two passages where it, it, it doesn't and some even those might be questionable but when you get to the New Testament, holy ones is never used of the members of the heavenly host. It's only used of human believers. Might that be important? Why did that term get mapped over to human believers? It's because God is in the process of saving a remnant and ultimately making them conform you know, to, to the image of Christ, who is the image of God, as Paul says. And we will be glorified and brought back into the family council. We will, we will, Christians form the reconstituted divine council. This is why it's, it's said in 1 Corinthians 6, we're going to judge angels. It's why we're put over the nations. It's why we, we share the throne. You know, these are passages in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. All this stuff that's said about Christians. You know, we, we are going to replace what has been lost. God is going to get his way and he's going to circle everything back to the beginning. 
and he's going to do it without eliminating our freedom or destroying us. Okay, this is the story of the Bible. And, and so, you know, as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become the children of God. Okay, you have authority there. You have the child, you know, the, the child status. You, have, you know, the, the light, saints in English translations, it's hagio, it's holy ones. Okay, this is why the terminology is important. Terminology in the New Testament has a history. Okay? Okay. It's traceable back to the Old Testament, but we, we, we never really do that sort of thing to, you know, to wonder what's going on. I get people ask, why does God need a council? Sounds heretical, sounds crazy. Well, God doesn't need anything. He doesn't need the church either, but he gave the Great Commission. He doesn't need you, but he saved you and wants you to be his disciple. God doesn't need anything. This is just what he wants to do. And, you know, that that's a, a core concept. So th this heaven and earth symbiosis that was very obvious to the ancient mind, both in the Old Testament, especially in, you know, in, in the intertestamental period, this really picks up steam because they're looking at their Old Testament and writing about it. So there were these concepts of, of an angelic priesthood that believers, the faithful, would be transformed and, and would be glorified and would become, again, counsel partners with God. Well, yeah, because that's what Eden was supposed to be. And that's what the New Testament describes. It's just that the linchpin for, for having all of that be a reality is Jesus. They didn't have that in the Second Temple period, but they saw it in the Old Testament. So I, I think, you know, we, we need to pay attention to the supernatural world because it's a template for us and God also has opposition there. Okay. okay. There's rebellion in that realm, not just the human realm, that affects the entirety of the human experience. You know, Deuteronomy 32 is the other core, I think, to this. And that is just to cut to the chase, if if you asked a you know the average Christian, why is the world such a mess? What, you know what what's up with depravity and evil and you know why why do people suffer so much? The answer you'll typically get is oh that's the fall. <laughs> if you, if you ask that to the sect to a, again a Jew living during the time of Jesus and we know this because they write about it a lot, that's not the answer you would get. The yeah. answer you would get is well there's actually three reasons why the world is a mess. The fall is the first one. That's where rebellion begins, both in the supernatural world and the human world. But then there's also this matter of Genesis 6, which, which they, the meaning of that chiefly to them was the, the proliferation of human depravity. And I talk about that a lot you know, in, in my books. And then the third one is what happens at Babel, uh, you know, which we, we know the Tower of Babel story. We teach it in Sunday school. I've, I've read Genesis 11, 1 through 9, Mike. I don't see any supernatural beings in there. Well, you're correct. But you might want to go over to Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. Then you'll get them. You know, God God confuses the languages, divides up, divides humanity into the nations of Genesis 10, according to the number of the sons of God. And reading that with the Dead Sea Scrolls, as some modern English translations now do, thankfully, like the ESV and you know, NLT, NRSV. But the idea is that we have three problems. Genesis 3 gives us death, yeah. estrangement from God. Eden is no more. God's vision for what he wanted evaporates, but he doesn't give up on it. There is no plan B, and he's not going to change the rules. I created humans. I shared my attributes with them, one of which is freedom. I'm not going to touch that because I didn't make a mistake the first time around, but I knew that this would result, and so I planned before the foundation of the world how we're going to reverse this. But we have a death problem now. And I need to bring people back into relationship with me and give them everlasting life. I need to overcome death for them. They can't do that themselves. But God has a plan. And then the second one is the proliferation of depravity, self-destruction. Okay, just to, it, that's a two-word description of what, what emerges out of Genesis 6, 1 through 5. And then the third is human fragmentation you know, and chaos among the nations. What the Bible describes is that when God judges humanity at Babel, 
for, for disobeying him yet again after the flood. I call it the Romans 1 event of the Old Testament, where God says, okay, you know, look at what we have here. We had a flood. I repeated the Edenic covenant to Noah and his sons, which is a signal that I'm not giving up on you. And here we go again. Instead of dispersing over the world like, like Adam and Eve were supposed to do to make the rest of the world conform to Eden, and instead of you know following at least that one step here, dispersing over the world, what do you do? You gather in, in Babel, you make a, a ziggurat, a tower, which is part of a temple complex, and you built them to, to, to bring the deity to you. That is not the plan. God says, I will not be tamed. Okay? Mm. This is not your agenda, it's mine. So what I'm going to do is if you don't want me to be your God, let's try something else. I'm going to divide you all up and I'm going to assign you according to the number of the sons of God. We get a re we get an another comment on this in Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20. Deuteronomy 17, 1 through 3. Deuteronomy 29, 23 through 26, where the nations are allotted to other gods, to other supernatural beings, and those supernatural beings to them. This is the Old Testament explanation of where why the other nations have pantheons, how everybody goes from a knowledge of the one true God to other gods. Because this arrangement, God intends them to be placeholders. He still loves humanity. They're his imagers. So he wants the, the, the supernatural beings who are essentially guardians or, or patrons or placeholders over the nations. He wants the nations ruled according to, to justice because they're my imager. Okay, these, these are human beings. I still care about them because even when he, when he abandons them, when God divorces humanity in this way, and he picks one guy, Abram, right after the Tower of Babel to start over again, he makes a covenant with Abraham and says, it's going to be through one of, your, one of your children, one of your offspring, that all these other nations are ultimately going to be blessed. We're going to bring them back into the fold. So he hasn't forgotten them, but what happens? Psalm 82 says that the gods of the nations sow chaos and tyranny among them. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 17, the Israelites fall into worshiping the other gods instead of the true gods. The entire covenantal relationship is, is, is really formulated around choosing Yahweh against all other gods. You can, be, you can fail in other ways, but this is the dividing line right here. You know, and what emerges in that in the Old Testament is a sense of cosmic geography. Israel is Yahweh's domain. All the other nations are under dominion of something else. And they're rivals. They're enemies. The whole thing devolves and becomes a, a chaotic mess. And Psalm 82 is about God judging the gods. That, that's what the whole psalm is about. And he's, he judges them because they of the way they treat people under their care, verses 2 through 5. He says in verses 6 and 7, you're all gods, you're all Elohim, all of you, but you're going to die like men. Okay, I, I am numbering your days. And then in the last verse, the psalmist say, rise, says, rise up, O God, and take back the nations. Well, again, th this is the vision. And, and the, if you believe that, that you have these three problems, death, depravity, you know, fragmentation, what, what God wants in Eden is blown up entirely. It just blows up because of rebellion, the, the, the hunger for autonomy, the resistance, you know, the, the refusal to submit to, to a good God. If you believe that, then you believe the Messiah is supposed to fix all three. Hmm. He's not just here to reverse death. He does that through the resurrection. Mm -hmm. But the resurrection and ascension affect the other two in very clear scriptural ways. Example. How do we get the Holy Spirit to come to it to initiate and launch the new covenant? He ain't coming unless Jesus ascends. Jesus isn't ascending unless he rises from the dead. And he's not rising from the dead unless he dies first. Okay? Mm -hmm. You know, all these things are necessary. And so when, when Christ ascends, the Spirit comes, and now believers have the Holy Spirit with them to help them resist the devil and, and fight against depravity. But Paul, in, in six other passages, equates the resurrection and the ascension also with the stripping away of the authority of the principalities, powers, rulers, thrones, dominions, authorities. Again, the, the, all these terms are terms of geographical dominion. 
And Paul gets his theology from Daniel 10 and Deuteronomy 32, where you have supernatural powers over geopolitical entities. Okay. The resurrection and ascension, that, that authority is nullified. And, mm -hmm. and that the terminology is important because God is the one who set this thing up. Again, not, not wanting chaos, but okay. again, they have free will just like everybody else, you know, his, his creations. And, and they, they rebel. They, again, they search for autonomy. They want to be worshipped instead of him. So only God can say, you're judged now. The authority that was given to you initially that you abused, I am removing. The Gentiles now are free to come home. I not only want them to come home, but I insist on it. This is this is Paul's message. He even he even alludes to Deuteronomy 32 and Acts 17. You know the, about the thing about the unknown God. I mean, this is laced divine counsel thinking, family and partnership, and and this whole cosmic geographical thing and this rivalry bleeds from the Old Testament into the New Testament in dozens of passages that we never see because we don't see them back in the Old Testament. We're taught in Christian tradition to embrace the fall. Mm -hmm. We are taught not to see anything supernatural in Genesis 6. And we never see what's going on at Babel because our English translations didn't use the Dead Sea Scrolls or the, or the Septuagint for that matter. You know, it, it, so we, we get one out of three, which, and, and it blinds us to seeing the, the full impact, the, the full coherence, the full intelligence of the biblical story told across the Testaments in dozens of ways, dozens of threads relate to this. And all of a sudden, all the weird passages, you know, why is it that the priests of Dagon don't walk over the threshold where they found, you know, Dagon? It's cosmic geography. That turf is under dominion now. Yahweh defeated Dagon. We're not taking any chances. You know, I mean, there, there's just a slew of, of strange passages that all of a sudden can make sense in the ancient supernatural worldview. And, and if we can see them, we will appreciate even more what goes on in the New Testament. You know, Jesus goes to places that have histories. And what he says there taps into those histories. And Jesus does things very deliberately to telegraph not only to the people around him what's going on or what, you know, what he intends to do, who he yeah. is, but also to the supernatural powers that live in that place. I mean, there's just, yeah. there's yeah. a lot of this stuff going on in, in, in both Testaments, but you can't connect the dots if you eliminate lots of dots from the Old Testament. You can't do it. Yeah. Well, Dr. Hayes, I have to bring you in uh, to more practical stuff because as a practical theologian, uh, all the stuff you're talking about, as true as they are, and as mind-boggling as they are, and uh, you know, referring to your text that Christians imagine these things and bring them into, into some sort of uh, reality. Well, the truth is, or at least this according to me, I'm, I'm just pulling you into this to say, Clearly, this is the reason why many doctrines have found a place in what I call heretical graveyard because of the imaginative <laughs> invention <laughs> around that unseen world. I, I, I love, that's a great phrase, actually. <laughs> I'll have to so, steal that at some point. <laughs> you go ahead. So if we were to occupy ourselves with knowing Christ, and I think that's my proposal to you, that then our understanding of the unseen world will be less speculative and more Christ-focused and Bible-based. Isn't that the case? Wouldn't that be no, the I, case? I, I agree. You know, I, I can only say what, what this has sort of done for me because it, it was, you know, again, I, I had the same transition. and It was, it was scary because I knew I would lose friends. I knew I'd probably not, not get jobs, you know, it, it, just in a, in a practical sense. But what it's done for me is it, it's fixed my mind really on two things that, and, and again, not, these aren't new, but, you know, they, they just get a little bit of a different twist or an emphasis. And that is my, my destiny. Okay. My destiny is, is bigger than, oh, I get to go to heaven 
and play harps and sing just as I am for a zillion years. No, no, you actually, you actually are going to be a partner with God in the fullest sense. You're fit for his, his presence. You don't, have, you don't have to think about that or worry about that anymore. You, you are a partner with him because you are, you are united to him. Again, all these are old scriptural concepts. But essentially, my destiny is what God has always intended the destiny to be. And it, it, it's more than just a passive sort of, you know, what, are, what in the world are we doing in heaven anyway? You know, that, that sort of thing. You know, in other words, it's gotten me to, to think about heaven in terms of a new Eden. What would, what would life in Eden have been? And, and how awesome is that going to be? And, and again, just the relationships and, and you know, the presence of God. And, and so it, it helps me think more about destiny ruling the nations in terms of I get to be like like Adam should have been. I'm going to get to administer and enjoy all this and, and with other people, you know, again, who share the same experience. So that's one thing. It, it's made it less passive of a concept. And, and, and discipleship has become about fulfilling my destiny as an imager. And I, I now understand why Paul uses imaging language of believers, conform to the image. You know, the image of Christ, who is, you know, the wisdom of God, who is the express image. I, I get it. I get it now. You know, this is this should be natural for a Christian. This is what God what, what God not only wants, but what he enjoys. You know, th- this is this is letting God have his way. It, it, it's seeing God's plan work, <laughs> okay? which is fun. He gets to win. The other thing is the the whole concept of the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, Paul links that explicitly to the Great Commission. And he does it through the phrase, the fullness of the Gentiles. When the fullness of the Gentiles occurs, then Israel will have its reawakening. And then the end will, you know, will come. You know, th- everything's going to go full circle. And so I get questions like, and I had questions like, well, do, the, do supernatural powers of darkness think they can win? And I have an answer for that now. No, of, of course they don't think they can beat God. That's ridiculous. They know who God is. But it depends how you define winning. All right, if God links the fulfillment of all his plans to the fullness of the Gentiles and the, and the Great Commission, again, encompassing all the nations, then all we really need to do as supernatural powers of darkness is to distract the church from doing its job. We need to blunt the Great Commission. And if we do that, we can kick this can down the road forever. I mean, we, we, we can, we're still here. So if we define victory as we're not destroyed yet, we're still here. They're doing okay. And so it's really made the focus of, of of what I do, the the intentionality of what I do, land on the Great Commission. Yes, I knew that was our job, but it, but I, I didn't see sort of the the eschatological cosmic ramifications of what was going on, and that is actually how you define spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is not going into a building and shouting things. And, Yes, I believe that demons can and need to be exercised. I mean, I, I feel like I ought to listen to you guys because you probably, you know, have the, you know, this sort of part of your ministry is more prominent than over here where nobody believes anything, you know, which is an exaggeration. But, you know, I, I understand all that. But real spiritual warfare is doing the Great Commission because as the kingdom of God grows one at a time, the kingdom of darkness diminishes. And we inch closer to the fullness of the Gentiles, the accomplishment of the Great Commission, and then they're toast. So if you want spiritual warfare, you mean just ask yourself, what would frighten a principality? It's not your music. It's not shouting. It, it, you know, it, it's none of this stuff. You know what frightens them? Being reminded of their destiny. That's what frightens them. Being reminded of how they're going to end. And, and also reminding them that 
I know what you know, and I'm not going to be distracted from doing the job, doing the Great Commission. If the church in mass did that, I mean, not only would, would life here be a lot different, but that that gets the job done. That That moves us closer to the return of the Lord because all of these concepts are linked. The Lord's not going to return unless he is satisfied with those who he has redeemed from the nations, the fullness of the Gentiles. This is the plan. This is the point. And so, you know, that's what they're afraid of. They fear their end. You know, and, and you know, what we have in the New Testament is their end has already begun. It's one of these already but not yet things, you know, like, like lots of things in the Bible are. So Paul can preach about the nullification of their authority, but they're not going away. They're fighting for their turf. They're resisting the Great Commission because that's how they stay here. That's how they stay alive. Mm-hmm. And, and we need to realize what's at stake just by, you know, if Jesus came back or if, if, if the whole Jesus story was repeated today and, he, and we all gathered and watched him ascend, he's not changing what he says. He got it right the first time. You know, okay, the Great Commission is it. That is it. It's the only thing that ultimately matters, you know, with this. So it's really helped me fixate on that. And and that helps with discipleship. You know, I don't I don't want to do things that would that would harm my effectiveness in that process to attain that goal. I don't want to, as Paul would say, I don't want to disqualify myself. You know, the Great Commission itself is, if we grasp what it is and what it means you know, to the return of the Lord, it, 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 it's something that, that should keep us in line and help us stay focused on, on being, you know, the, the kind of people God wants us to be. So it, those two things, I think, have really, again, it, there's some of those things, I, dots that I didn't connect before. But a lot of it is, is old stuff. But, but I think about it differently now, and I think about it more often. That's amazing. Well, Dr. Isa, um, um, let me just quickly speak to the audience. You guys, you've, you've got an opportunity to ask Dr. Heiser questions. And uh, we will open up the, the chat facility just now in about 13 minutes, 12 minutes, uh, for you to post your question. Question is that which contains a question mark behind the sentence. Please ask a question. Um, and you are well, uh, welcome to already think of that. And you can post that then into the chat as soon as the public chat is opened up. Dr. Isa, something uh, else that you mentioned that I picked up as well in chapter 2, um, you actually wrote and you speak about King Ahab in 1 Kings 16 and 18, and you make the comments on page 34. You say God could just predetermine events to make everything turn out the way he wants to, but he doesn't. Um, and I found this fascinating because then in chapter 4 on page 61, uh, you showed that, um, and for a lack of a better word, you say that, uh, when we look at God, He foreknows certain things, but it does not. It does not mean that foreknowledge requires predestination. Mm-hmm. That is a huge question that is coming up in Africa, especially. Do you maybe want to comment on that and, and sure. just say what it means from your perspective? Yeah, I, I, I'm sure that I know. I don't know what I can't give you a page number, but in First Samuel 23, that's that's sort of a foundational passage. It's not the only. It's not the only instance of this, but it's, I think it's the most clear, where David saves the city of Kyla from the Philistines. Okay, I mean, David does this, that's his job at this point. And then he decides, well, you know, we got rid of the Philistines, so I'm going to stay here for some R&R, you know, rest and relaxation in the city. Well, well Saul hears that David is in Kyla. You know, the narrative tells us that Saul finds out somehow, and he thinks, I finally have him. David, you're an idiot, because Kyla is a walled city. So Saul knows all I need to do is go down there and surround the city, and he ain't getting out. And then I'm going to say, we're going to destroy the city, or we're just going to wait here for months while you starve, and, and we're going to cut off your water supply until you hand him over. So Saul thinks, finally, I've got him. So he prepares to go down, and then the story switches to David hears that Saul knows where he's at, and he knows he's in trouble. So what does David do? 
he says, hey, bring hither the ephod. <laughs> okay, I, I got to talk to God. <laughs> so he, he asks God two questions. And he says, will Saul come down to Kyla to get me? Okay. And the Lord says, yep, yep, he'll do that. And then David says, okay, well, when he comes down, will the men of Kila hand me over to Saul? And God says, you betcha. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're, they're going to do that. And so what does David do? He does what you and I would do. He leaves, okay? He gets out of Dodge. He, he leaves the city. But what does the passage show you? God foreknew two things that never happen. Foreknowledge does not necessitate predestination. And by the way, our Reformed creeds actually tell us the same thing. God knows all things real and possible. Okay, we, real and possible, those are two different things. The fact that God knows the possible doesn't make it real. Because God knows all possibilities, so I guess everything happens. Even if it's mutually contradictory, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's philosophically, intellectually, and in terms of just real life, absurd. Foreknowledge does not necessitate predestination. God is free to predestinate what he wants. I think God does that. I think there are passages that certainly, you know, God says, I'm taking my chess piece from here to here. Okay, God makes his move, but he doesn't do that with lots of things. There's no need for him to do that. I, I, I use the, the, you know, the chess illustration. What's more impressive? You know, if, if I'm, I'm God and I'm playing you, you, one of you guys in chess, and we sit down at a table and I say, look, we're going to play a game of chess now, and you're going to lose because I predestinated all your moves. Let's begin. <laughs> okay, that, that's impressive a little bit, you know, that God could do that. But here's what's more impressive. We sit down at the table and I say to you, we're going to play a game of chess now. And you can move wherever you want. And I'm still going to win. Because I'm just that good. <laughs> you know? I mean, that, that, that is a little more impressive. And that's what God is actually doing. He does not remove free will. He didn't do it at the fall. He, did, he's, he doesn't do it subsequent. And think about it. I, I spent a lot of time, in, especially in Unseen Realm, talking about the concept of the image of God. The, the image of God is not an attribute given to us. It's a status that mm -hmm. we have. We are God's imagers. We are his proxies. Mm -hmm. But, but to, to function that way, God has to share his attributes with us to make us distinct from animals and, and whatnot. So he shares his attributes. This is just the simple theological category of the communicable attributes. One of those is freedom. So they're linked to the image, but they're not the image itself. Now, here's the point. If you take one away, okay, that's cheating. That means you can't perform as God's proxy anymore the way God intended. Mm. Well, I got news for you. God does not cheat. Okay. All right, he knew what was it what was at stake when he created humans and gave them the attributes he did. He knows they're imperfect. They're either going to make a mistake or they're going to rebel. They're not him. They're like him, but they're not him. But God anticipated that because he's God, but he lets it play out as he created people because ultimately, even even when we get the pain of, of evil and suffering, you know, God could have wiped it all off the table, but, you know, what evil really shows us is that despite the horror of it, and we think we suffer. Again, I got news for you. God sees every evil act every day, everywhere. You don't. Mm. Okay, he has it worse than you do, all right? We don't. Mm. But God would rather have that set of circumstances emerge out of human creation than not have humans at all. And you can get wow. angry with God for that choice. But yeah. if you really think about it, that shows you how much God values and loves. He is obsessed with having a human family. Mm. Sure. So it hurts. Uh, uh, yeah. There it is.
Well, Dr. Uh, Heiser, I think we will not do justice if we don't bring you to one of yeah. those uh, heretical um, uh, <laughs> doctrines. Well, here's one that, that, that I'm sure you must have met uh, and dealt with it somehow. Were the sons of God in Genesis 6 fallen angels? Yeah, I, I actually don't like the, the, the terminology. I, I will say, that, yes, they are supernatural beings. Angel is a job description. Mm. Um, you know, there, if you read the, my angels book, the first chapter goes over this you, real quickly. You got three buckets to put the language of scripture in when it describes members of the heavenly host. There are terms that tell you what a thing, what the thing is, ontological terms. Things, words like spirits or Elohim is one of these terms actually. Elohim has nothing specifically to do with a, with a unique set of attributes. I talk about this a lot in Psalm 82. Um, it, it's, it's a spiritual being. You would call something an Elohim that by definition is a member of the disembodied spiritual world. That's why biblical authors use Elohim of things that are not the God of Israel. It has nothing to do with attributes. Multiple Elohim is not polytheism. It's not a denial of monotheism. There's only one Yahweh. Yahweh is an Elohim. There's lots of Elohim in the spiritual world, but only one Elohim is, is Yahweh, okay? So you have, you have terms that tell you what a thing is. You have terms that tell you a thing's rank. Sons of God is actually one of these because um, the language is drawn from the royal court of the ancient Near East. It, it's a hierarchical term for members of the heavenly host. And the third bucket is our job descriptions. It's what angel is, it's a messenger, right? So the sons of God of Genesis six, yes, they are supernatural beings. The Sethite view makes zero sense. I go through all the reasons why in, in unseen realm, but the only one I think you really need, let's go back to your very first question, that which I said is an issue of biblical authority. Peter, in 2 Peter 2, refers to the angels, plural, that sinned. And he mentions them in conjunction with Noah and the flood. Okay, Peter interprets the sons of God of Genesis 6 as supernatural beings. And some people will say, well, well that probably refers to the, the rebellion of Satan with a third of the angels before human creation. Well, that's wonderful. Can you show me a verse that says that? That's a Christian myth. Okay, there is no verse in the entire Bible that has Satan and a third of the angels rebelling before human creation or before the fall. Zero. In fact, if you have if you have software and you can concord this in two seconds or less, the word third and angel occurs in only one passage together. Revelation 12, where the war in heaven breaks out, not in response to God's thought that I'm going to create humans. War in heaven breaks out at the birth of the Messiah. It's very clear. It's just explicitly clear. So the only candidate you get for angels that sinned is Genesis 6. So Peter, here's your question. For those of you who don't want to say the Genesis 6 sons of God are supernatural beings, are you right and is Peter wrong? That's the question. Okay, I am not going to say Peter is wrong. I'm not going to correct him. Yes, I know the passage is weird. You know, I can't explain how Genesis 6 works scientifically, just like I can't explain how the virgin birth works or the resurrection. Okay, I can't explain any of those things. Scripture teaches these things about supernatural beings in the spiritual world. That world is not subject to the laws and tools of science, or modern enlightenment rationalism. Just deal with it, okay? It just doesn't. And nothing you believe about the gospel does either. So it's time to own it. It's time to own that, okay? We, we either believe, you know, in the authority of scripture on uh, when, it, when it speaks to the spiritual world, or we don't. Yes. So, you know, I, I, I'm landing on, on yeah, I, I, I'm gonna accept that. And it, philosophically, it's quite coherent. See, because all of these things extend from a very simple thought. Thought number one, there is a God. Okay? That has held up quite well over millennia of assault. 
philosophically. I don't need to appeal to scripture at all. There is a God. Okay, if there's a God, does that God act intentionally? Does he have intelligence? Can he do things? Well, if he couldn't and didn't, he wouldn't be God, would he? Okay, so it, all right, is that is that God capable then of creating beings who could act in this way, like like take on human flesh and and do these do what flesh does? Because you know other passages, angels are in flesh and they do physical things. Okay, again, I can't explain how it works, but could God create beings with that ability? Okay, wake up to the twenty first century. We can create human flesh. It's called synthetic biology. Okay, it's a subfield of genetics. We can do it from the atom on up. You can get a PhD at Harvard in synthetic biology and build new life forms. So the question is again, are you smarter than a deity? No, you're not. I know that's a blow to maybe somebody's ego, but no, you're not. So all of these things that we think are, are too weird and, and, and not rational according to our scientific worldview, they're actually philosophically quite coherent. So I can't explain them, but I can defend them. Absolutely. Again, philosophically, it, it's not that hard to do. So mm -hmm. why do we back off? That's because it's good. uncomfortable. Because it's well, uncomfortable. Well, Doc, we, sorry, Doc, to interrupt. We have to move on. I see there's yeah. a few. Yeah, some people, say, should we hit, should yeah, we hit some, some of these questions? Yes, some people have submitted their master's thesis in the, in the questions. Uh, but let me start off with a question just pretty straightforward. <laughs> uh, somebody said In chapter six, you mentioned God appearing in human form, usually as the angel of the Lord. Now, what stuck with me was that this was before the incarnation of Jesus Christ, God the mm -hmm. Son. And he says, this is on page 82 to 83. Was this Jesus appearing before his incarnation or the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I, I don't, I would not phrase this as this is Jesus appearing before his incarnation. I would say it this way. This is the second person of the Godhead appearing as a man in physical corporeal form before the incarnation. God as man in the Old Testament is not incarnation. Incarnation is being born of a woman. Okay, you, get, you travel through the birth canal. Okay, you got to learn how to eat with a spoon. You got to learn how to go potty. Okay, you got to learn how to talk. That's different. That that is that that really goes beyond God embodied in the Old Testament. But I believe it's the same person. So Jesus of Nazareth was the baby that came out of Mary that got that name. So so that that's that's the that's the the latest and final and most dramatic example of God becoming man to work his plan. So it, it it's a little it's different than saying, you know, second Saying second person becomes, you know, comes in the form of a man in the Old Testament is different than saying the incarnation. But yet you have this overlap because the second person is also going to become incarnate in Christ, in Jesus later. So it's a little bit the same, but there are some significant differences. And so I, that's the way I word it. Excellent. Maybe another question relating to that. Dr. I say in the Old Testament we find the angel of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord, and Yahweh himself sometimes even mentioned together and interchangeably in yeah. one passage like Isaiah 48, 16, uh, Isaiah 63, Psalm 51, etc., etc. Are these instances fair to use as a description of the triune God? Yeah, here's where the, the short answer is yes, they contribute to what we think of as, as the Trinity. Here's how I, I approach this, and, and people, I think, um, if you went up to YouTube and you Googled my last name with two powers in heaven, you're going to find lectures on this. So I spent a lot of time in unseen realm. Again, that's the more academic version of supernatural, talking about the two powers in heaven doctrine. Judaism used to teach that there was a Godhead, which they limited to two. 
there was the transcendent invisible God, and then there was God in physical form, like the angel of the Lord. They could be in the same scene at the same time. They were different, but they were also the same because they were both referred to as Yahweh. Okay, so you have this two thing going on. Daniel 7, Son of Man, is probably the most dramatic example of, of this kind of thinking. But there are, there are whole books on this written by Jews. Alan Siegel, 1977, The Two Powers in Heaven. Benjamin Summers, more, more recently, I think 2010 or something, The Bodies of God, where he says things like the Christian concept of the Trinity is perfectly compatible with the Hebrew Bible. Just point blank. And he's a Jew. He's, he teaches Bible at a Jewish theological seminary. Okay, he, he's not a he's not a closet Christian. Okay, so why do they do this? It's because you you get God in 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 human form in these various places, and and there's there's this two thing going on again, transcendent and imminent. If you have that in your head, how that's expressed, there are passages like let's just take Isaiah sixty three. If you compare Isaiah 63 to Psalm 78, and you get to the part about how they provoke God, okay, in both passages, in one place it says they provoke the Holy One, the other place it says they provoke the Spirit. Well, which is it? The answer is yes. Okay? The angel of the Lord is also in, you know, these passages, Psalm 78 as well. So if you have the... the the, the two Godhead in your mind, you will be able to see, and Jews did, that, that the Spirit is somehow sometimes talked about the same way as the second Yahweh figure is. Now take that into the New Testament. All of the second Yahweh motifs and messaging and vocabulary is used of Jesus. So in the Old Testament, look at, here, here's how I, I, I talk about it. This is where Trinitarianism comes from. In the Old Testament, you have God, we'll call him the Father, okay, the transcendent God, and then you have the second Yahweh figure who is embodied. And then you get, you know, the Spirit looped into this in a few passages. Well, if you move it over, if you move the middle one over, and now you have Jesus, you have God the Father and Jesus, and then you have the Spirit. Well, this is why Paul says things like the Lord, who is the Spirit. He does that twice to the Corinthians. It's why Spirit of God and Spirit of Christ are interchanged in several passages. It's why in Acts chapter 8, where we're told that the Spirit of God, you know, tells Philip to do something, and, and, it, and earlier it was the angel of the Lord, or an angel. You know, they, it uses the angel terminology. Again, th this is, if you have this in your head from the Old Testament, what you will see is that where Trinitarianism actually comes from, is it's it's inherited from the Old Testament, and it's it's blown up in in all its fullness with Christ at the center. Christ mm -hmm. is but isn't God. He is God. He's the same deity, but yet there's a distinction between Christ and the Father. And just as Jesus is but isn't God, so the Spirit is but isn't Jesus. That's if amazing. Jesus is God, if Jesus is God, the other two are brought into the picture. That's where Trinitarianism actually comes from, that, that, the, the doctrine. And the, the formulaic language, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it, it reflects that. But where it actually comes from is not those formulaic expressions. It actually it gets inherited from the, the Godhead thinking of the Old Testament. Excellent. Well, the next question, Doc, uh, maybe I can merge a question from Tawanda and the Rave Jerry. Uh, he says, what are evil forces capable of doing in regards to their abilities and how they work within this world? And then to wonder, ask, where does the devil Lucifer fit into this? Does being the god of this world mean he has authority over other gods? Or is he just one in a myriad of false gods? What was the first part of that again? The first one. Uh, what are evil forces capable of doing? And then where does the devil Lucifer fit into all of this? Yeah, I, I <laughs> they're capable of doing more than the, the church tradition gives them credit for. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, <clears throat> there's a lot of things that we think the powers of darkness cannot do that scripture never says they can't do. That's why I say that. So what, what, what they can do is they can, 
they were created just like humans were, except without bodies. This is why we get the plural language in Genesis 1.26, where God is speaking, you know, to the heavenly host. It, it's not a reference to the Trinity. Again, there, there, there are reasons why that doesn't work in Genesis 1. There are reasons why it certainly doesn't work in Genesis 11, where we get the, you know, us language again. And you can read Unseen Realm for, for all the reasons for that. But what, what the language of Genesis 1.26 does is it, it says somehow humans are going to be like God, but they're also going to be like these other guys too. And how are they like the other guys? Well, they're God's imagers in the spiritual world, and God shared his attributes with them too, intelligence, you know, free will, all this kind of stuff. And he does with us. So there's this, this symbiotic relationship. They don't participate in our creation because all the verbs of creation are always singular. Okay, so the, the text is very clear there. But it leaves us with a situation where we are lesser, you know, Psalm 8, we're a little lower than the Elohim in Psalm 8. Hebrews uses the Septuagint a little lower than the angels. But in many ways, we're, we're alike. So what can they do? They can do what we can do. Okay, but we actually have more limitations because we're embodied. They, can, they have creative ability. They have creative intelligence. They have problem-solving intelligence. They can contact people. They can communicate. You know, why is it that in Deuteronomy 18, there are certain practices forbidden about contacting the dead or, or the non-human spirits in the underworld? Okay, because they're there, and they can be solicited and contacted. They, and, and that, they, they can influence behavior. The princes of Persia and Greece, Daniel 10. Again, we never ask where Daniel gets his theology. The answer is Deuteronomy 32. Okay, but but Daniel 10 doesn't rule out that Nebuchadnezzar is a tyrant. But what it teaches us is that behind that human tyrant and his apparatus and his administration and his team of thugs, there's a greater intelligence. Again, if, if I were a cosmic power of darkness, I would work smart, not hard. What I'm looking for are the people who have the power and influence over the masses. That's who I'm going to influence. You know, there are a finite number of these guys, the bad guys. Scripture only uses the myriads upon myriads language for the heavenly host of the good guys. Did we notice that? It's true. It, it never uses the innumerable language for the bad guys. There's a finite number of these guys. And so what they're going to do is they're going to sow chaos among humans through political apparatuses, through power structures, through anything that's going to influence humans. They're going to destroy the family. They're going to work through media. What they need to do is they need to find a few key people to capture their minds, their thought processes, to control their thinking, to enslave them, because that guy's gonna do all the work for me. So they can do lots of things like that. Let, well, let's go to Lucifer. Satan, <laughs> Lucifer is actually a Latin term uh, that comes from Jerome's Vulgate, a translation of Hellel uh, in Isaiah 14, 12. Hellel ben Shakar, the shining one, the son of the dawn. So that figure is, again, I refer to that figure as the original rebel because I do believe Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 are, are tapping into or repurposing uh, the fall story from Genesis 3. I know Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 aren't about the fall. Rather, they're, they're tirades against two different kings, but what's used to, to portray those kings in their, in their awfulness are certain trappings of an original primeval supernatural rebellion. Else why in Isaiah 14 would, would the rebel say, would Hillel say, I will be like the most high. Okay, I will sit among, you know, I, I will sit over the stars of God. This is divine counsel language. It's not human, you know, geography language. So that figure, again, I think is the primeval rebel. I don't know if did, did the person loop this into the Satan terminology at all or, or, or was that not part of the question? So ba basically, Lucifer, Halal, I think is the primeval rebel. He is, he is the number one rebel. And I, I think the reason why, you, you should read the demons book on this, because I go through 
Satan in Old Testament, intertestamental literature, and then the New Testament. What happens is that the original rebel begins to be perceived as being preeminent, mm. that the other ones report to him. I, I, I think there's a reason for this, even though you, you don't, I don't have a verse for it, but there's a, there's a good theological reason for it. Because A, he gets street cred because he was the first, and B, more importantly, the result of what he does means that he becomes owner of everything because everything dies. Every human dies. The earth is going to die. You know, he has preeminence because sooner or later, every living thing is going to show up on his doorstep. This is why the book of Hebrews talks about him having the power, you know, over death. The power, you know, he has to be defeated, you know, for, for people to have, you know, eternal life and so on and so forth. This is why he, he gets street cred. You, the, the, the gods of the nations, the principalities, they're not going to have people to rule over ultimately because ultimately the first rebel is going to have them all. So I think there's a good reason why he is perceived as the, the chief arch enemy because he destroys everything initially. The others are important contributors to human misery and chaos. But at the end of the day, this is the one that everything's going to be at his doorstep. And he knows it. He's the God of this world, as Paul says. You know, it has to be defeated. Well, thank you for that, Doc. Well, a very deep theological question from Rudy. It's not me, so it's another Rudy. He says, is the so-called speaking in an angelic tongue or language, or also called gibberish, a supernatural language? And what is your view on Sidroth, his prophets, and Kenneth Copeland, are they operating in the supernatural? Okay, okay, I found it here. Sid Roth, his prophets, Kenneth Copeland, are they operating in the supernatural? You don't have to answer questions. Well, I'll answer it. Um, <laughs> the first one, <clears throat> I'll, I'll answer this way. And I'm just being honest here. I don't know that there is a, there is a clear... Um, argument to be made for angelic languages being tongues or a prayer language. I say it that way because there is that possibility. Okay, that the, the text can sustain the idea if look if, if there are a few features of the text looked at in certain ways. So I don't think it can be ruled out. Certainly, the the gift of tongues at Pentecost, and I think that that Paul is talking about for the most part. Because he quotes the Old Testament, there's that Old Testament popping its head up again, are known languages. These tongues are specifically designed to spread the gospel among the nations. They're not gibberish. So I think most of what, what happens today in, in, you know, in, in this tongues area, I think, is gibberish. I think most of it is, but I'm, I'm certainly willing to believe that some of it's not. I personally have met missionaries that and they have no reason to lie to me, okay? They were in tough spots in certain countries. They don't know the language, and all of a sudden they can. Good. Good for you. The Lord, the Lord empowered you to do that and saved you through that. Wonderful. I don't have a theological problem with that at all. Okay, so I'm, I'm not resistant to the idea that God can do these things and still does. But I think most of what happens in church, in churches, is not that. There's another reason why I say that. I, you know, again, for, for over 20 years, I've had my head into what we might loosely call the paranormal fringe community. I know and can show you abundant examples and studies where the gift of tongues that is gibberish is found in all sorts of pagan antichrist religions. Okay, so it troubles me when the same gibberish occurs in Christian contexts and people assume that it's the Holy Spirit and not some other spirit. Because I know that in many cases, it ain't the Holy Spirit. So that puts me on guard right away. Again, I'm just being honest. Now, the prayer language thing, 
you know, it depends how you take Paul's experience in, in Second Corinthians, you know, his voyage to heaven and his trance state or whatever like that, because he, he seems to say both things, that I heard things that are unutterable, but then later on it, it, it's like he, it's, he seems to have understood it. So how can it be gibberish if he understood, you know, who knows? Now, in, in Second Temple Jewish tradition, this went two ways. Some thought that that the ecstatic, you know, language, you know, that, that you would you would you would hear when you went to the heavens, the language of angels, was Hebrew. I mean, you'll you'll actually find this in, in texts, you know, that, that the, the angels are speaking Hebrew. <laughs> and others will will default to the they're speaking in an unknown language that humans can't can't understand. So that would be, you know, that the angelic tongues idea. I have friends who who practice praying in tongues, and I don't you know, I, I don't trouble them and it doesn't trouble me. If, if if this is a practice that genuinely draws you closer to the Lord, good, good for you. You know, because I, I can't categorically say that scripture rules this out. And I will admit that it doesn't make much sense to me because God knows what's in my head and my heart without any words at all. He doesn't need to give me a language to tell him something or the language in my spirit, the groanings, it says groanings of the spirit. It doesn't say language, by the way. Um, God doesn't need any of that. He already knows. But if, if it helps you in your prayer life, if it helps you focus, if it, if it gets you to pray, you know, good. I mean, I think the Lord's going to use that. At the end of the day, I can find out that, boy, you missed the boat here, Mike. You were completely wrong here. And I'm fine with that. I just don't know. I'm not. I don't. I don't see scriptural certainty on that aspect of of the tongues question. Um, but I'm very cautious and very wary. So I think a lot of what goes on in TV with these televangelists and stuff like this, I I do feel that a lot of it is contrived. And I, I what it what, what what the reason I don't like it is not that. You know, what goes through my head is not that you need a theology lesson, Mr. Copeland. What goes through my head is you're creating a culture of haves and have-nots in the church, and you're manipulating people. Okay, I, I just don't see that, that as, as a good thing. You know, Christians have enough trouble because of the, the whole question of the law. They have enough trouble, this is going to sound awful, but those of you who have been believers for a long time are going to know exactly what I'm saying here. A lot of Christians need to be reminded after they accept the gospel that God does not need you to do things to make him positively predisposed to you. Mm. He loved you while you were yet a sinner. Romans 5.8. Why is it that we have people understand and embrace the gospel, and then two, three years down the road, they wonder because they're struggling with sin or they don't have a gift. They wonder if God really loves them the same way he did when they met him a few years ago. And I, I think it's a terrible thing to cultivate that uncertainty in a Christian. And so I see a lot of this prosperity stuff, and this, you know, whatever label it goes by, that, that, you know, I have this experience and you don't. A lot of Christians translate that into God loves him more than me, and, and maybe, maybe God doesn't love me as much anymore. Mm. That's a terrible thing to do. It's a Absolutely. terrible thing to do to a Christian. Doc, just in closing, maybe a last question. I saw this morning that uh, you've got a new book, a companion to the book of Enoch, which is a reader's commentary on the Book of Watches. I think this is only the first volume that's coming out. Yeah, that's the first you wanna, uh, Obviously, you're going you're gonna to espouse a lot more on Genesis 6 and some of the other passages, but do you quickly want to tell us about that? Just in closing, last question. Yeah, there, there, is, there is a second volume out. It, it ships, I think, this week. You can get it on Amazon, I think. But, uh, yeah, a reader's commentary is not a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. It's, it's like if I was sitting down with you and you were reading the Book of Enoch, I would be pointing at things saying, you know, hey, 
you know, this is interesting, and here's what it means, and here's how it, it might factor into Old or New Testament, you know, interpretation. Here's here's what they were thinking about their Hebrew Bible or, or whatever. So I, I, I try to, to create a, a little companion, you know, like that for Enoch. There's, there's nothing else like it. And by the way, you know, it, it's the Book of Enoch. It's a Second Temple Jewish text. I don't think the Book of Enoch was inspired or canonical. Um, but you know what? A book does not have to be inspired to be important. Believe it or not, biblical writers read books. They really did. They read books. And Enoch, the, the content of Enoch, especially the first 36 chapters, bleeds into the New Testament in a number of places. It's, it's only really specifically quoted once, but the theology of it, I'll give you one example, the book of life. Okay, Enoch and other Second Temple literature, you know, have a lot to say about that, that the book of Revelation picks up on that isn't in the Old Testament references. So it, th these books are important because biblical authors in the New Testament read them, and sometimes their content, content helps them express an idea that connects to their Old Testament because the, the people writing this stuff between the Testaments, they're, they're, they're commenting on the Hebrew Bible, which they believe is the Word of God, just like we do. It was the Word of God. And so they're, they're trying to connect data points. And look, look at all this stuff that the Bible says. What does it mean? How do we connect the dots? That's what they're doing in between the Testaments. And New Testament authors read a lot of that stuff and found it useful, you know, on occasion to help them articulate something that, that was inspired, uh, you know, as a product of inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So the more we, we know that stuff, the more intelligent of a reader we will be of the material that is inspired, that is in our Bible. So I think it's a good thing to be familiar with that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Doc. I see everybody is begging and asking, must Dr. Heiser go? Um, can we stick along and can we get along as well? Uh, and maybe uh, in later, uh, when we have time again, we will definitely bring Dr. Heiser back. But we also don't want to overextend you know, this, this first well, session. Um, yeah, the, the truth is that Dr. Heiser would love to stay, but Dr. Heiser has a boring meeting in about 10 minutes. <laughs> 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 so if, if I had my choice, <laughs> well, we, I mean, we can, you know, we can do it again in the future. That's fine. Absolutely. No, we will definitely do so, Doc. Well, thank you so much for your time, Doc. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you, guys, for all of the questions that you've inboxed. Uh, thank you for everything that you've asked. Uh, we will definitely have Dr. Heiser back on. This was exceptional. We can just, you know, if we, we can just listen for hours. I don't know about you guys, but I was really deeply stimulated. It uh, just, just invigorates my perspective on the Old Testament and my hunger for the Bible. Um, so thank you so much, Doc, for your time. Thank yeah. you so much for speaking with us. Thanks, Caswell, again, for joining, uh, asking questions. Thanks to Cornelia in the background, um, some of the girls that are working and uh, making sure the applications work well. Thank you to all of you. We're going to leave Dr. Heiser so he can get to his meeting. Doc, I will communicate with you on email, and I will definitely ask you to come back in the future. Well, but thank you so much for your time. Yeah, if, if, if we get to do that, I would like to hear from some people on your end about the, how the supernatural you know, affects your ministry. And just, mm -hmm. just you know, some, because I, I always feel like, especially in, in uh, Africa, South Africa, some of the Latin American countries, that, that you, you're the boots on the ground, okay? And, and this is a real part of, of ministry uh, for you. So I, I enjoy hearing, you know, about just anecdotes or experiences or things that, that you did specifically in ministry that relate to this. So we can make that a part of it. But yeah, you know, my, my my meeting is showing up here, so I gotta. I gotta <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Doc. Maybe we'll pay you with Doctor Mzondi. He's told me a few stories that made my hair stand yeah. up from on the back of my yeah. head. Uh, thank you so much, Doc. Have a lovely day, and thank you so much once more for being with us. Yeah, you bet. Thank you.